Bonjour, Kinemage and Ireland Indigenous Cast, and welcome to today's iCivics lesson on campaigning. The goal of today's lesson is to understand the process of campaigning. We know what's going on around us. We see lots of yard signs. We see lots of commercials and speeches and rallies and those kind of things. We also see them in a different way, virtual rallies and Zooms, things that may that were never really a thing just a few short months ago. I'm going to read this to you. The questions will be found in a Google Doc, a Google Form, I should say, at the very end. So campaigning, it's a process. So you want to run for president? Okay, maybe not this year, but eventually, once you meet the age requirement, that's 35 years old. Well, be prepared because running for office, any political office, is no easy task. Political campaigns require tons of time, effort, and money, especially if you intend to win. Get organized. So what does a person have to do to run for president? To be elected president, you must be a natural born citizen, which means you're either born in the United States or your parents are American citizens, at least 35 years old, and live in the United States for 14 years. So you can be born here, move to Canada, and then come back, as long as you've been here for 14 years. Easy enough. But most candidates announce that they're running for president at least a year and a half before the election. And that's not all. To be a candidate requires planning, major strategy, and lots of workers to help them get elected. All of this effort and action is part of a campaign. Political campaign is an organized effort by a group of people to get a candidate elected to political office. Candidates will use fundraising, volunteers, staff, appearances, speeches, and more as part of their campaign to persuade the public to vote for them. The, the bigger the office, president, senator, the more resources and time it takes, but it still takes these same elements if you're running for tribal council or city council or mayor, or state representative. It might not cost as much money, but it's still pretty important to have those people working with you. One size doesn't fit all. Campaigns may be small or large local or national. They may be focused on getting one person elected or on getting several people who support the same idea elected. It all depends on the type of election. National elections, like presidential or congressional races, are large and require more time and money. They're often split into phases. Primary election, also called primaries, where voters, usually members of certain political parties, vote in each state to select candidates for the larger general election and the general election itself, where all voters have an opportunity to vote. Local elections, like mayoral, or mayoral races, require less money and volunteers, but still call for a significant amount of organization and planning to be successful. Got it, let's run. Still ready to run for president, or council, or city commissioner? Well, first you'll need to announce that you're running. You also need to fill out a form with the Federal Election Commission, the government organization that oversees all federal elections. Now this is going to be if you're running for Senate, president, well mainly president, everything else is more state organized. Um, each level may have its own rules. So if you're going to run for tribal council in, in eight years, you want to look ahead of time, what are the rules, what documents do you need? Next you have some fundraising to do. Serious candidates must raise or spend at least 5,000 in camp campaign contribution of their expenses before they can officially become a candidate. After that, campaigning for the primary election begins. It's going to be a lot more money than that nowadays, at least at the federal level. Campaigning, it's a process. It doesn't stop there. Most presidential candidates need to be supported by a major political party to win. The two major party committees, the Republican National Committee, the RNC, and the Democratic National Committee, DNC, hold primaries and caucuses in each state starting in February, all the way up to the summer of the election year. And guess what? During all that time, candidates are campaigning throughout the country to win votes, at least in normal years. They have to work hard just to come out ahead in the primaries. Then in the summer of the election year, the parties hold national conventions, where they announce who their official nominee will be. Once a candidate has their party's nomination, the race revs up even more, 
and so do the campaign efforts leading up to the general election in November, which is where we're at right now. Campaigns inform and characterize. Sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? You might be thinking, why not just save all the fundraising, ads, and speech making, and just let the people vote? That's one way to think about it. Without campaigns, voters wouldn't be as informed about what the candidate's platforms are. Every person who decides to run for political office creates a platform, the issues they stand for, not on, and what they promise to do once elected. In addition to the platform, campaigns help voters help get to know the candidates themselves. What kind of people are they? And what were they up to before deciding to run for office? How have their experiences allowed them to understand the problems your community is facing? Candidate stance, experience, and character are qualities you'll want to consider before casting your vote. Voters find the answers to questions like these more on a candidate's website in interviews and television ads, through speeches and newspaper articles, during the debates, and through public appearances, all pieces that add up to just one part of a candidate's campaign. Ching! Expenses time. Campaigns can cost millions of dollars. And today, presidential campaigns, we're looking in hundreds of millions of dollars. Mostly because the United States, is take, it takes a really long time to get elected. Our election process is stretched out over months, usually starting in the summer, the year before an election, and running till the Tuesday after the first Monday in November of the election year. And because of the effort required, many campaign organizations may start months or even years before that. Most, almost, most run almost exactly like a business with tons of employees and volunteers all working together for the duration of an election season. Where does all the money go? As you can imagine, appearances and ads are expensive. On top of that, it costs money to pay the essential staff members who help the candidate come up with plans and strategies to get elected. Campaign staff include paid positions like managers who create the, and direct the campaign's plans and consultants who help with everything from media to fundraising. Campaigns also include tons of unpaid volunteers who participate in phone banks, calling voters to inform them about the candidate and canvas in neighborhoods. Canvas means you go door to door knocking on doors. Um, that's really where, um, especially in small elections, where you actually earn the votes. You ask questions of the voter, the voter asks questions of you. It's actually pretty neat to see. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a, one of my friend's city commission campaigns back in my hometown and going door to door and seeing what people had to say. Not what should you see the definition next to it, knocking door to door to talk to voters in person on, the, on their candidate's behalf. All these positions cost money to maintain from staff salaries to office equipment for volunteers. Along with the expenses for the candidate like travel and meals, costs can add up pretty quickly. And the more local the election, quite often it's more likely to be heavily staffed by volunteers. All right, so now how do candidates raise all that money? Well, sometimes they can't. In recent years, the cost of campaigns has increased so much the candidates have to spend millions of dollars before the race, race is even over. Candidates who can't raise that kind of money are forced to drop out during or even before the primary elections. Those who can raise the money do it in a bunch of different ways. Wealthy candidates have the option of funding their own campaigns. Others may use grassroots fundraising. At the presidential level, nobody can afford to fund their own campaigns. Nobody does it. It's all about fundraising. Where they ask many, of, many people to donate small amounts of money, often through email and social media. Candidates may also rely on private fundraising events, which allow people to meet candidates and pledge their support in person. Individual donors can only contribute so much to a campaign. The FEC sets a limit on the amount of an individual can give. Remember, that's the Federal Election Commission. From Page A. Can you think of any reasons why? Well, we don't want people to buy the president. Major reason is to help limit the possibility of corruption. You can see up here how much money was earned, raised here. And you can see the lighter the state. But this is also where states tend to raise, have the more people, obviously, the more money likely to be raised. Presidential candidates from major political parties may receive public financing through the federal government as well. Candidates can qualify to receive matching funds from the government in exchange for limiting the amount of money they spend. To qualify, candidates must first show that their campaigns have 
enough public support by raising 5,000 each in at least 20 states. Candidates who refuse matching financing can spend as much as they can raised privately with no limits. Hold on to your hat, campaigns and their donors are not the only per money in politics these days. Thousands of organizations also raise and spend money in support of the candidates. These org organizations are called political action committees and super PACs. Super PACs can spend unlimited amounts of money in support of their candidate, but they cannot give to a candidate's campaign directly. Super PACs will usually spend the money they raise to pay for media messages supporting their candidate or sponsor opposition ads against their candidate's opponent. While PACs are limited by how much they can raise and give to candidates, super PACs aren't. And individuals can tr contribute to PACs and super PACs that support their candidates too. These are, are unless the, the uh, advertisement ends with, I am Mike Ireland and I approve this message, quite often the other ones are all done by super PACs you can just spend so much money. Many people think that the government shouldn't limit can campaign contributions. After all, isn't showing support for the candidate of your choice a form of your free speech? Others think that without such limits, candidates might be tempted or pressured to repay large donors with special favors once elected. And some people often see campaign cont contribution limits as a way to ensuring those with more money don't hold more influence over our leaders and government than those with fewer means. The FEC requires that all campaign contributions be made public and media outlets like news broadcasts, newspapers, and reputable contri contribution tracking websites like opensecrets.org help keep our elections honest. That's not to say that there isn't places like through action committees that you can't give a lot of money. Not every dollar is made public, despite what's said here. There's still a lot of money out there. But it's not just a money game. No, it's not. Candidates with the most money don't always win. In order to get elected, candidates have to get personal. Voters don't want to see a candidate on a TV screen. They want to meet them and hear from them in person. Winning an election requires a candidate to focus on reaching people in all states. Oftentimes, candidates focus on states where neither political party dominates, called battleground states. Campaign efforts in states like these are essential as it's uncertain whether the state will sway red for Republican or blue for Democrat. Electors in the Electoral College, the constitutional system of electors, has the final say on who our president will be, usually vote according to the majority of the state. In many states, that's the law. Although in 2016, where there was a half dozen addition of unfaithful electors who voted for other people. During their campaigns, candidates work to persuade the majority of voters in as many states as possible, especially in those with a wide range of political ideas in order to win. Michigan this time around is one of those battleground states. Florida is a battleground state this year. Arizona, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Those, those states are gonna hold a huge amount of sway in who's going to win the election in November. In the end, is it all worth it? Absolutely, even though the campaign process is long and complex at its core, it's about making sure people are able to choose the rep representatives that are right for them. It's a process, but it's worth it. We have now reached the end of this reading. You may now return to the Google Classroom and open the form to complete the assignment. Bama P.